Okay, so let's get started. So the topic of today is the final main topic we have to learn in this subject, which is conformal mappings. So and definitions of what a conformal map is differ slightly, but the Stein definition is as follows that if f goes from u into v and is bijective and holomorphic, then we say it's conformal. Okay. So we have some subset of the complex plane U and we are mapping it bijectively onto some subset V and that's what we call the conformal mapping, okay? At least in the convention of Stein. So here's a, here's a result uh, proposition. So suppose we have F goes from U into V and is holomorphic and injective. Then F prime of Z is not equal to zero for any Z belong to U and The inverse mapping f to minus one of the image back to u is also holomorphic. All right, so I'll do with the first part first. So proof. Now, the reason we can prove this, uh, well, I mean, this is this is true in more generality, but the reason we can prove this in a very efficient way as you're about to see or a very neat way is because of the very special things about holomorphic mappings that we know. Um, so we're going to argue by contradiction. So suppose that we have that f prime of z0 is actually equal to 0 for some particular point z0 belonging to our set u. Okay, so what kind of structure can f have around z0? How can this happen? So here's a kind of hint. So consider the mapping g of z, which we're going to define to be equal to f of z minus f of z0. All right, tell me about g of z. In particular, tell me about g of z around z0. Come on, people. <laughs> Audience participation, come on. We know it's holomorphic, right? We know that we know that the way we've constructed it, g of z0 is 0. And as you say, the derivative is also 0 because you just differentiate this thing and that's what we get. OK, so now let's just think about g. What kind of mapping? can we have around Z0 if we have that stuff going on? What's the nature of G in this situation? This is, this, is, this is something which we use over and over again. This is one of the basic ideas. What, what do we know about G when we have stuff like this? How can G possibly be? What's the nature of G locally around Z0? So Z0 is a zero of g and we've learned this characterization of zeros right that g of z therefore is z minus z zero to some m times a holomorphic function z we've done this particular characterization many many times right a lot of stuff comes out from the fact that we can explicitly say what things behave like around their zeros because we have this form where h is holomorphic and h of z0 is not equal to 0, 
And this holds true in some neighborhood. Some, ah, uh, yeah. So on a very small scale, then Z is very close to Z0. So H of Z is very much just like the constant H of Z0, right? Yeah. So as you say, it's somewhat like a polynomial, like Z minus Z0 to the N, yeah? Yeah, cool. So this is our point X0. We have some little ball around it, yeah? What is this mapping doing to it? What is the action here? What is happening to a small ball like this? If I drew the image of if I drew the image of this small ball, and let me put something inside it. Suppose I put suppose I put this like arrow semicircular arrow, what happens to the image of the semicircular arrow under the action of this mapping? So for sure, g of z0 goes to 0, right? So we are, let me change this a little bit. We are sending this to 0, yeah? And what happens to the image of this, of this semicircular arrow? I mean, this is a really explicit thing, right? Because we're taking R to be as small as we like, so we can just forget about this thing. It's just like a constant, right? So if I just had a constant here, then we could explicitly calculate everything, right? And then what would you see? What would you draw? What would the image of this semicircular arrow be? Roughly. Come on. Depends what the order of this M is, right? Yeah. But this thing would be going, I mean, M is going to be at least two, right? Yeah. So if I have a semicircle, then this thing at least gets turned into a circle. Yeah. And maybe it's wrapping around many more times if M is higher. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever. So the arrow looks like this. So this is what's happening to the image of this thing. Yeah. In particular, this little ball is taken and wrapped around itself at least one time. Yeah. Because we have to have that M is bigger than equal to two. Yeah. Because we know that both G is a zero and G prime is a zero. So we can't just have M equals one. Yeah. Cool. All right. So that means that locally, I'm going to take some piece of paper. We are taking our space and we are wrapping around itself like this, right? That's what we're doing. Yeah? At least once, maybe twice, maybe whatever. Yeah? So this thing locally does not look like it's injective anymore. Yeah? At all. Yeah? Yeah? So we would expect this to be true, that this theorem is true, because if we had a point where the derivative was zero, then we can create this function, yeah, which is the same as f, we're just shifting it by some particular constant, right? And if we look locally, then what's it doing? It's taking the ball around z0 and it's wrapping it around itself at least two times, whatever. However many m is, it's wrapping around itself m times, yeah? Which doesn't look like a, uh, well, which doesn't look like injective behavior at all, right? Yeah. So that's the idea of the proof. So what I'm really emphasizing a lot is to visualize the picture of what this stuff is all the time. Turn this into pictures, and that's all we're doing. We are we are arguing by contradiction. We are setting up the consequences of this contradiction, and we're saying, okay, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this, huh? And the key idea, uh, or the key thing which we're using, which we've used many times, is that the structure of holomorphic functions is so special that, that when they have zeros, it's of a very particular kind. Yeah? When they have zeros, it's a very particular kind. It's something like this, yeah? 
which means that it's going down to zero in a very, very special way. And all kinds of stuff follows from that, right? So that's one of the key principles. I'm hoping you, you people have solidly in your heads that the behavior of holomorphic functions around their zeros is incredibly, incredibly regular. It's incredibly understandable, which is not true outside of holomorphic mappings. If you try and do this for mappings from Rm to Rn, it's just nothing so nice it happens. Huh? So this is one of the big gifts that this subject gives to us, that we understand locally very, very well what happens. Yeah? In calculus, we understand very well what happens when the derivative exists. Yeah? But this doesn't require the derivative to exist. This is everywhere. So everywhere we understand very, very well what happens. Yeah? Yeah? Cool. All right, that's one of the key principles, which is the principle we're going to use. So we are going to try and get a contradiction from this fact that we've assumed the derivative is zero somewhere, because we see this thing wrapping around itself. Yeah? We're going to try and build the proof out of the fact that we don't believe this is true. We don't believe that we can have an injective mapping doing this thing, wrapping around itself. So I've done this for G, but G is basically the same as F. So if I thought about this with respect to F, that's just like taking G and adding this constant to it, right? And if we did that, then it would be doing the wrapping around zero and then adding that to F of Z zero, no? Which is just like wrapping around F of Z zero, actually. Yeah? Okay, but maybe it's easier to think about wrapping around zero because we're so used to thinking about these mappings. Z goes to Z to the M. So I'm not going to uh, I should <laughs> keep that on the board. All right, now tell me what tool do you think would be useful for showing that we failed to be injective? So failing to be injective means what? It means that we expect that if we are close to zero, there are multiple things mapping onto, onto that particular point with G. No? That's what we expect. No? Yeah. So with respect to F, that means, so this is the, okay, this is, a, this is how we're gonna do this. So this is G, and then with respect to F, it's the similar thing, but now this is, this thing and now we just take this mapping that wraps around zero and we just add we just shift it so that the center is f of z zero so that's what f is looking like yeah that's what f is looking like and what we'd expect is that if we take some point pretty close to f of z zero no yeah? then because the nature of f is to take stuff around z zero and and take this ball and just wrap around itself and then stick stick it back onto f of z0. We'd expect multiple points to be mapped onto any arbitrary point close to f of z0. That's what the picture tells us, yeah? Cool, now what tool is good for that? What tool is good for that about counting the number of times something is happening? Like yeah, the winding number stuff. Do you remember the name of the theorem? It's, it's Roche's theorem, right? And the statement of Roche's theorem was that if we had something f that that well this was the this was the image to keep in mind if we have something f that winds around zero a certain number of times and we perturb it by adding a g you know, where the absolute value of g is less than the absolute value of f on the circle you know, then the f plus g must wind the same number of times around you know? and therefore by the argument principle we have the same number of zeros of f plus g as we have of f you know? Cool. Okay. So we're going to use that principle. That's the natural tool to use because finding the number of things that are mapped onto some arbitrary point W you know, when we set it up correctly is the same as finding the number of zeros of some mapping that we're going to create. Okay. So let's do this. So we have some z0 such that this representation is true, okay? Yeah. Um, let us take some little delta around f of z0, and we'll choose delta later. So let delta bigger than zero be small, okay? And then pick 
W belonging to the ball of radius delta around F of Z0. Yeah. And what we want to do, we want to consider the number of, of uh, Z that are mapped onto W. Right? which is the same as considering the number of zeros of f of z minus w. So consider f of z minus w. Yeah? And we're going to break that up as f of z minus f of z zero plus f of z zero minus w. Okay, and then f of z minus f of z zero is our mapping g. So this is equal to g of z, and then this thing is, by definition, it's something which is small. So uh, let's just write this the same, but that's what we're going to think of as being our perturbation. Okay. So this is our, our, our perturbation, what previously would be called capital G in Roche's theorem. And this would be the capital F. So let me change color for these things. And the point of Roche's theorem is to establish that we have capital F plus G having the same number of zeros as capital F, so long as the absolute value of G is less than F on the boundary of the ball, yeah? by this winding number principle. Now, F plus G has to be winding around zero the same number of times as F. Yeah? Okay, so this is looking good for us because we know G is very small by construction. Yeah? And what is F? going to be on the boundary of the ball. Well, f on the boundary of the ball is uh, uh, this is our ball, right? So what is, what is f? f is just this thing, which is this thing. Yeah? And if we make our radius r small enough, then this thing is close enough to whatever constant we want. Yeah? So then the size of G on the boundary of the ball around Z0 is pretty much like the radius to the power M times H of Z0. Yeah? Which is some preordained number. Yeah? Some preordained number. Because we just need to choose the R0 such that this representation is true. Yeah? Yeah? And then after choosing that, we can choose the delta so that this thing is definitely smaller. Yeah? And then we have the conditions for this Roche's theorem. Yeah? You see what I mean? So then we can say, okay, well, then the number of zeros of f plus g, which is the thing we're trying to figure out, is the same as the number of zeros of f. Yeah? The number of zeros of f is at least whatever, m. Yeah, because, uh, because that's the very definition of G itself. So G has at least M zeros inside our ball. Yeah? Cool. All right, so I'm going to raise this. We're going to try and keep in mind. Yeah? And our goal is to set up the radius R so that we know that this thing here on the boundary of the ball isn't too small, yeah? which means we have to take it close enough so that H of z is close enough to h of z zero to not mess things up. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. So this is our setup. We have this f of z zero. We are taking some radius delta, and we have some w inside this ball, okay? And we are trying to show that the mapping f of z uh, minus w has got multiple zeros, and we broke it up into f of z minus f of z zero plus f of z zero 
minus w, and this was our decomposition. Now we're going to apply Rochet's too, right? Ooh, this is g. This is the main thing that's doing the winding around, that's generating the zeros. The capital G is the perturbation. And we have that f of z minus zero is equal to z minus z zero to the m for some m big and equal to two times some holomorphic function. I hope I called it, I hope I called it h. I think I called it h, right? So inside some ball of radius uh, uh, around uh, Z0 itself, uh, H is holomorphic, H of Z0 is non-zero, yeah? So take R1, which is sufficiently small, such that we have that the infimum of the absolute value of h of z on the ball of radius r1 around zero, oops, not around zero, around z0, is actually bigger than h of z0 over two. By continuity, we can do this, huh? Yeah? So, that's definitely true. So then if we now consider things on, on inside the ball of radius R1 and we take the boundary of this, so on, so for Z belonging to the boundary, the ball of radius R1 around Z0, I think it's nicer to call it R0 just because it's more kind of symmetrical expression. Okay, so the boundary of the ball of radius R0 around Z0, then what do we know? We have the, the absolute value of F minus F of Z0 is bigger than or equal to right, which is this thing, since it's on the boundary, is just this thing to the power M, and then this thing by choice of z0 is bigger than h of z0 over 2, and that's it, yeah? Cool. So we know that, that this function, capital F, on the boundary is bigger than some definite thing, definite pre-chosen thing, yeah? So now we have the right to take delta to be it's definitely smaller than this, yeah? So pick delta. to be, say, between this and half of that thing. And so, with this setup, we therefore have that capital F of Z is definitely bigger than capital F of G of Z on the boundary of the ball zero around z zero, where capital F means this and capital G means this, because the absolute value of capital G is just delta. Yeah? Cool. All right, so that's the hypothesis for Rochet's theorem. So G is not messing up the number of times. Let's start that again. So G is sufficiently small so that F plus G is winding around zero the same number of times that capital F is. So by Roche, oops, theorem, cardinality including multiplicity of zeros of capital F plus G, which is just F of Z minus W, okay, is equal to the cardinality counting multiplicity of just capital F, zeros. Oh, I should say 
that this is for z inside the ball of radius r, zero runs at zero. So the number of zeros of this function inside this ball, counting multiplicity is the same as the number of zeros of Uh, capital F for Z inside this ball, counting multiplicity. But capital F is just this function, this, which has at least M zeros counting multiplicity. Yeah? Cool. So there are at least M zeros of this thing counting multiplicity. Yeah? Cool. So what does that mean? That means counting multiplicity that we have got at least mz that are mapping onto this w right here. Yeah? yeah. So let's draw another little picture. So this is z0, this is w, and we have at least mz that are mapping onto this thing with respect to f. Now, we would have now killed injectivity if what? If we have that these are distinct points, right? If they are distinct points, that kills injectivity. Yeah? So the only way that this thing can continue to be true is if they're not distinct points. So we must have that all of the points mapping onto W um, mapping onto W with respect to multiplicity, right? Yeah? Because it's a number of zeros counting multiplicity, yeah? Yeah? So we can't have distinct zeros. So by injectivity, we cannot have of f of z minus w. So, there, we do at least have one z that's mapping onto w, yeah? Because counting on z. So pick z such that f of z is equal to w, yeah? Yeah, actually let me give it, uh, let me give it a specific name. Let me call it zeta because we're using z as the variable. So pick zeta such that this is true. There's at least one, for sure. Yeah? Cool. Now, what does that say? Well, that means that the mapping z goes to f of z minus w has a zero at zeta. Yeah? Okay, cool. And we know more because we know, again, that the number of zeros of f of z minus w, counting multiplicity inside this little ball, is at least m, yeah? So if we look at this mapping, yeah, we look at this mapping, just wrote it here. So if I keep, yeah, okay, I'm going to give it another name, maybe escalation of names, but but it might clarify. Uh, so what letter should we call it? Call it uh, Q. So if we let Q of Z be this mapping, F of Z minus W, right? Then once again, we have that this thing is a zero, yeah? yeah? But what else do we know about this particular zero of the mapping Q? What else do we know? Use the principle we just talked about, this overwhelmingly powerful thing that we know about holomorphic mappings. 
What else do we know about this particular zero? What can we do with any zero of a holomorphic mapping? Absolutely. Louder? Hmm? Someone said something. Whoever, I didn't hear it. Uh, sorry, I said they're isolated. <laughs> yeah, they're isolated, but but we don't. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is maybe too general. What do we know? Yeah, okay, what do we know that's relevant to this story here? What did we just do before, which was helpful? We use the representation of zeros, right? We use the fact that we can represent zeros really well, right? So if this is a zero, so Q of zeta, oh, sorry, Q of z is equal to z minus zeta to something, let's call it n, and then some other function, let's say L of z, where L is holomorphic. Yeah? And L of zeta is not equal to zero. Yeah? Cool. Now, tell me about this representation. What do we know about this representation beyond that, given the stuff we've established? Well, the only thing which is to be specified, perhaps, is what this n is. Yeah? And what can the n possibly be? So we have at least counting multiplicity, m zeros of this thing. Yeah? We have at least m zeros of this thing. Yeah? Yeah? And we've said that by injectivity, all of these zeros have to be at the same particular point, zeta. Otherwise, it's not injective. Yeah? So that means that when we write this mapping like this, yeah? then this n has to be at least bigger and equal to m. Otherwise, it's not true that we have m zeros of this mapping given by this. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? Give me a thumbs up if so. Give me a thumbs up where I can see it in the screen. Okay, perfect. All right, so. And since... Q has M zeros. I don't know how to express that. No, let's write that. Yeah, let's do it this way. Since Q has M zeros inside this pool R of Z0, R of R0, Z0, all of which live on the point zeta by injectivity. So, M, or N is bigger than or equal to M. Yeah. Cool. All right. So that means that we have that this is true, that F of Z minus W is equal to Z minus zeta to the N L of Z. Yeah. Cool. All right, but what's the consequences of that? Well, if we unwrap this, let me try and keep it on the same board so I don't have to rewrite too much of this. This is what we have here, right? So that means the same as f of z is equal to z minus zeta to the n l of z plus w. w is just some constant, right? It's just picked. If we differentiate this thing, we're going to get n z minus zeta to the n minus 1 L of z. Uh -huh. And then plus 
z minus zeta to the n l prime of z, right? So in particular, when we stick in l prime of zeta, it's just equal to zero because it's zero from this thing because n is at least bigger than equal to m and m is at least bigger than equal to two. So this part doesn't vanish, yeah? And this part doesn't vanish either, right? So when you stick in zeta into this thing, we get zero. So f prime of zeta is equal to zero. Yeah? Cool. And that's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. Tell me why. This is our original setup, right? Yeah. And we are doing this setup inside this little ball around Z0. And Z0 was the point at which we argued by contradiction and assumed that Z prime of Z0 is equal to zero. Yeah? And now it looks like we found another point where Z prime is equal to zero. Yeah? And that other point is inside this small ball, right? Yeah? So why are we happy that we've got a contradiction now? And in fact, from this representation like this, yeah? making the ball as small as we like, means that we can guarantee that this point where f prime of z0 is equal to zero is the only is the only zero of f prime. Yeah? Because f prime is a holomorphic function, its zeros are isolated. So around the small ball around z0, f prime should be non-zero. Yeah? Cool. So right from the beginning we have the right to assume that that there are no other points where f prime is equal to zero. Yeah? And this thing is definitely another point where f prime is equal to zero. It's definitely another point. Yeah? Yeah? It's absolutely not the same point because this point is mapping onto w, right? Whereas z0 is mapping onto f of z0, and we chose w to be not equal to f of z0. Yeah? Cool, so contradiction. Because zeros of f prime are isolated can assume f prime of z is not equal to zero for z inside the punctured ball of radius r0 around z0. Huh? Cool. All right. So when I put down the details, it's kind of a, kind of seems long, but, but uh, I claim it's not really long. It's just that, just that completely nailing down all the possible things means means putting lots of things down <laughs> but the actual idea is very simple it's just that if we have a zero of f prime you know, then that means when we consider the holomorphic mapping g of z which is f of z minus f of z zero then that thing has a zero at z zero and its derivative is zero at z zero which means it's wrapping around itself you know? Yeah. yeah which means that the mapping F is wrapping around itself and then putting things back onto F of Z0. 
that's the nature of the mapping of around any point where the derivative is zero, yeah? which is killing injectivity. Yeah? Cool. So this is like a saying that proofs are like the, the hygiene of math. So that's the geometrical idea, and I claim it's clear. And all we did here was just be absolutely sure we hadn't overlooked anything, right? Yeah? So all we had to do from this point is to be absolutely sure there was no issue to do with the fact that the other, the, the, the zeros we'd found of, of f of z minus w weren't all from the same point. Because yeah? a priori that might have been possible. But if we think a bit longer than no, that's not possible either because the representation of zeros we have is so, is so powerful that that means we have another zero of f prime. Cool, so we've proven the first half of the theorem that if it's injective, then f prime is non-zero everywhere. We have to prove the second part, which is that the inverse image is holomorphic. Since f is injective, then ugh. Since f is injective, then what do we know? We know that f to the minus 1 from the image back to the reference domain, this is well-defined. That's what injectivity means, right? Let's call this mapping G is well-defined. Okay, the first claim is that G is actually continuous. So claim G is continuous. Okay, suppose not. Suppose not, and we have, uh, let's call everything in the image W. We have WK tending to W tilde, where the limit as k tends to infinity of uh, uh, g of wk is not equal to g of w tilde. Yeah? Suppose that's true. Okay, so let's assume that this uh, is forming a bounded subsequence. Let's assume that's forming a bounded subsequence, and therefore we can extract a limit. So for some subsequence, and we'll deal with the other case in a second. The limit. Uh, let's call the subsequent something, say, kn. We have that the limit as n goes to infinity g of wkn is something. Let's call it, I don't know, let's call it uh, z to zero. Yeah. Then, by continuity, f of g of w Kn is in the limit going to be equal to f of z to zero. However, it's also because these things are inverses, it's also the limit as n goes to infinity of w kn, yeah? which is equal to Uh, w tilde itself. Uh, 
However, if we go from this line, then f of z0 should not be equal to f of g of w tilde because this thing is not equal to this and we're injective. Right, so since we're injective, we have these are two different numbers in the domain. So we shouldn't have that when we map f with respect to these two different numbers, they shouldn't be equal to the same thing, right? But that's exactly what we just have written. Okay, so this thing, this thing we can also write as f of g of w tilde, Right? So we have these two distinct numbers inside the domain. So this is the domain. This is z to zero. And this thing is a different number, g of w tilde, right? And what we have is that they are both mapping onto the same thing, which is w tilde, like this, with respect to f. Yeah? Which contradicts injectivity. Now, I, I, I paused and panicked for some reason, but everything was making sense. So let's go through it again. So, suppose it's not continuous. So we have some sequence tending to W tilde, where the limit of G of WK is not equal to what we hope the limit would be. Yeah? Cool. So, for this sequence here, for this equality by continuity of f, so this is continuity of f right here, this has to be true. This equality has to be true. Yeah? But because this thing, f and g are just inverses, this thing is the same as this thing. Yeah? Just by definition, they're inverses. And then this thing, because we set it up, Arguing my contradiction, this thing is not equal to this limit. So again, this thing is equal to limit W tilde. No? No? Which is equal to F of G of W tilde because again, they're inverses. So we have that G of W tilde and Z0, they're completely different things. They're completely different things. Because that's, that's our initial, that's arguing by contradiction. Yeah? But they are nevertheless mapped to exactly the same thing. Yeah? So this contradicts injectivity. Yeah? Contradicts. Okay, and I made the assumption that I can extract some limit z0 like this by saying that we are assuming that, that this forms a bounded sequence, which would be fine if u was bounded itself, uh, if this, or if we just have a bounded subsequence. If we didn't, then this thing would have to go off to infinity, and g would have to go off to infinity. Yeah, and that would still, well, okay, then we'd have to talk about functions at infinity. So I'm going to assume that u is bounded. I'm just going to assume u is bounded. I don't want to talk about limits at infinity and meromorphic functions with the finite infinity. So let's just take u to be bounded. Cool. So we definitely have that the inverse mapping is continuous. Yeah? The inverse mapping is continuous. Now, Let's take the derivative. 
see what happens. So G is our inverse mapping. So we have G of W minus G of this thing over this thing, W minus W zero. And let's see what happens to this. Well, let's, let's write it like this. Take W and W zero, let Z be G of W and Z zero be G of W zero. And then we can rewrite this thing as Z minus Z zero. And then acting with F onto this thing, we have F of Z is equal to W and F of Z zero equals W zero. So then we have F of Z minus f of z zero on the bottom right here. Huh? Cool. All right, so I'm going to take the limit as w tends to w zero of g of w minus g of w zero over w minus w zero. Then that is the same as the limit as w goes to w0 of this thing, z minus z0 over f of z minus z0. However, happily, since we know that g is continuous, when w tends to w0, then z tends to z0. Yeah? That's exactly the definition of continuity. So this is the same as the limit as z goes to z0 of z minus z0 over f of z minus z0. And, and, what, and what is this thing here? What is this thing here? So this limit exists. This is well-defined, right? So in particular, this limit also exists, which means that g is differentiable at every w. Huh? So G is differentiable and thus holomorphic. Cool, All right? So what do we got? So when it's injective, then the inverse is well-defined, yeah? The inverse is continuous, yeah? Which means that it's actually differentiable, yeah? Because F is differentiable and that gives us everything because once it's one time differentiable, there's a mapping from the complex numbers to complex numbers, then all the good stuff follows. So once we have an injective mapping, okay, we are all set. We have lots of additional structure. We have that the inverse is holomorphic and we can do all the path of the theorems both on the function and on, on its inverse. Yeah? We have a lot of cool stuff. Cool, so that establishes the theorem. And so what have we learned? So F goes from U to V, injective. Ah, I should have also said that since this is non-zero, this limit exists and is a finite number. So we're also using the fact that this is non-zero. This is injective implies that F prime of Z is not equal to zero and F to the minus one is holomorphic. Cool. And recall, we are saying that something is conformal if it's holomorphic and invertible, in other words, injective. Yeah? Yeah? And we say, we say that U and the image of U under an injective holomorphic mapping are conformally equivalent. Because we go backwards and forwards with our with our bijective holomorphic mapping. So conformally equivalent. Okay, cool. So this is Stein's definition of a conformal mapping. It's a holomorphic injective mapping. Um, some other books define it like this. So sometimes defined as
f prime of z is not equal to zero on uh, omega. All right. So this is obviously a more general definition because we've shown that if it's injective, then this is satisfied, yeah? But maybe they're the same. Probably not given the way I set it up. If they're not the same, tell me, tell me how they're not the same. What's a counterexample? I'm going to raise the board. Tell me why this definition doesn't imply the Stein's definition. So, simple example. would just be z goes to z squared on the complex numbers take away zero. Yeah? So this thing has non-zero derivative on this open set omega. Let's call that f. but it's very much not injective. It's wrapping around two times, right? So every single point on the image has exactly two pre-images, you know? So, but not injective. So this is indeed a more general definition, but it's a reasonable definition in 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 many ways because what do we actually care about in terms of conformality well when we started right at the beginning of the course describing what the structure of mappings that were differentiable were like we did this thing of saying okay if we consider f tilde of x y to be equal to f of x plus i y i want to call it g because we just used f where g is holomorphic, then the gradient of this guy is a two by two matrix, right? So it's g1, comma, uh, use the x notation, g1, comma, x, x, y, G2, comma, X, X, Y. G1, comma, Y, X, Y. G2, comma, Y. Right? And we saw that this belongs to these conformal matrices. And these matrices are just lambda times a rotation, yeah? So if we look on a very small scale in particular, so if this is some point here where we're taking the derivative, x0, y0, and we have, say, a couple of lines crossing at some angle, theta, yeah? Then what's this picture when we map it? It's going to be mapped around g tilde of x0, y0, right? This point. And the lines could be sent in different directions, right? But the angle between them will still be preserved, right? Because that's the nature of what this thing does, right? Yeah? So these are angle preserving mappings. These are angle preserving mappings locally whenever the derivative is non zero, yeah? So um, that is, as we'll see later, one of the key important properties that we like about conformal mappings. Okay, cool. All right, so we are going to consider following particular example. So take H like this to be the upper half plane. So this is a set of x plus i, y, where y is bigger than zero, so the upper complex plane. And since we're going to be using this a lot, now I'm going to define the 
disk D to be the ball of radius one around zero. Okay, and we're going to consider the following mappings. So f of z equals i i minus z over i plus z and g of w which is i of 1 minus w 1 plus w okay and our claim is that is that f will send uh, this half plane into the disk and it's a conformal mapping. And its inverse is actually given by G. Let's run it this way. So the fact that we have an explicit inverse means that it's a conformal mapping, right? Yeah. Cool. So that's our claim. Um, so we can, in a bijective, angle-preserving way, take this entire half plane and map it conformally to the disk like this which a priori is quite a unusual and strange result because this is an infinite infinite thing this half plane has infinite area and we're somehow compressing it into just this ball and we're able to do that preserving angles okay with these relatively simple mappings okay so let's try and get started on showing that so we are going to do this by showing that that f of the half plane is contained within the unit ball and that g of the disk is contained within the half plane and that they are inverses. Okay, so while I erase the board, think about why, if we can show this and this and this, why that establishes everything we want, that this is actually, F is actually a conformal mapping from the half plane to the disk. Think about why that's true, draw a picture, and then tell me once the board is erased. If we have that f of the half sp space is contained within the disk and g of the disk is contained within the half space and they're actually inverses to each other, then why so? Why do we have what we want? So let's draw a picture. Huh? So we have the half space. Yeah? And F is mapping it inside a disk, right? So this is the unit disk, right? So suppose F mapped this thing strictly inside this, right? So we don't actually have that F of the half space is equal to this. Suppose it's some kind of subset like this. So this is F of the half space, yeah? Yeah? then that would mean there is stuff outside, right? There's something here, which is outside, which is, which is outside the image of F of the half space, right? But we also know that G is mapping the disk back to the half space. So this thing is mapped here. So let's call this thing zeta, right? It's mapped into the half space by G. Yeah? Why is that impossible? Yeah. Since we also have that they're inverses to each other, since star if there exists Z 
zeta belonging to the disk, oops, take away the image of the half ball. Uh, sorry, the half space. Then G of zeta belongs to the half space. Yeah. And F of G of zeta is equal to zeta, yeah, which doesn't belong to the half space. By, by assumption, but also does belong to half space. But f of g of zeta, since this belongs to the half space, does belong to the half space. So it both does and doesn't belong to the image of the half space. Yeah? Contradiction. Oh, contradiction. And all this is is just expressing in words or in symbols what this picture tells us. Yeah? So once we have these three properties, then we know exactly that F is mapping the house space bijectively onto the disk. Yeah? And for the same reason, G is mapping the disk bijectively onto the house space. Yeah? Cool. And that's what we're going to prove next time in this example of something called a Mobius transformation. So we're going to study it in detail because uh, many of the specific things we'll see are common properties of Mobius transforms. And that's, that's a topic we have to get good at because as you're, I mean, I hope you may be looking at past prelim exams. There's always one Mobius question, which is find a Mobius map that does this, this, this. So this is another canonical question that, uh, that I want to prepare you for. So we're going to spend a fair bit of time going forward studying this particular class of Mobius mappings, uh, uh, so we can answer those kind of questions. All right, that's it for today. Have a great day. I uh, hope you saw that the homework is up. It's more prelim questions. That's what we're going to be doing most of uh, most of the rest of the semester. And um, yeah, the deadline is I think Saturday night or something like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll see you all on Thursday. Have a great day. Bye bye.